Well, hello everybody and happy lunch to you or lunch time or whatever that you want to put it. It's good to have you all today. We uh, are um, looking at another middle of the week here and another movement in our Old Testament study of from promise to exile where we began with Joshua and with judges. And last week we talked about Ruth and her unbelievably fantastic story. And we're going to move on a little bit now. Um, and we're going to talk about the story of Israel and the story of um, what happened to Israel in terms of her history, having kings, and how God interacted uh, with Israel and how Israel interacted in being faithful sometimes and unfaithful others with God. So we're going to be looking at first, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings. It kind of flows that way in terms of a of a narrative, a historical kind of narrative of what is happening in Israel uh, in these times. Uh, so we're going to dive into that again we do thumbnail kind of things every now and then we'll go right into it and i'll bring in some extra stuff here and there to to maybe give us a, a different insight into somebody or something in in the text or in in the story that is here in in the old testament um samuel there's two of those and kings there are two of those uh, books. So in a sense, it's as we call them, four books, and they focus on history. Uh, but I love history. And if you do history right, it, it's fascinating in terms of the story uh, within history. Uh, Joshua judges dealt with a period when there was no central Israel. There were tribes and they were brought together to help one another once in a while and brought together to fight with each other once in a while. Um, and there were judges that arose that were leaders in that period of time. But it it kind of waned, and Israel began to clamor for a king. And so Samuel and the book of Kings deal with getting a king and what it was like for Israel being that way. Uh, very quick synopsis. First Samuel moves, um, you know, with the story of, the prophet Samuel, his birth and his precursor, if you will, of being a prophet of God. And then it moves to the end of the reign of Saul, who is the first king, and how things are kind of prepped for David to become king. Second Samuel's devoted almost totally and in whole to the reign of David as king. Then following first Kings de deals with the end of David's reign as king, the following reign of Solomon, whom we're all kind of familiar with that name and the wisdom of Solomon. But then after Solomon, the division that took place in the kingdom, uh, the kingdom split into a southern kingdom and a northern kingdom. And uh, the work of the prophets in those times becomes emphasized along that way. And in Second Kings, it continues with the story of the monarchies uh, that lead to the fall of Israel and then later to the fall and exile of Judah. Um, so we're going to take a look in, in over the next few weeks in, in finishing this. And again, I hope we find something for ourselves as well as something we maybe did not know before. At the very beginning of Samuel, of 1 Samuel, it is the story of Samuel coming on the scene. Uh, you're probably familiar with it. We've used that story many times, a lot of times for child dedication, etc. Uh, you have here uh, two people, Hannah and Elkanah, and uh, Elkanah and, and Hannah cannot seem to have a child. But Hannah doesn't quit praying for God to intervene. So as often seems to happen sometimes in, in the Bible narrative, you find um, people who the world has given up on and who have been consistent though in their faith and their prayers and God delivers. And in this case, God delivers a child by the name of Samuel and they live, uh, the, the, the local 
church, the church of the area where they live is a place called Shiloh. By the way, that's if you see a Shiloh Baptist church or whatever, that's where they take that from. And Shiloh had this uh, uh, center of worship and that was uh, officiated by uh, the priest Eli. And then he had his sons who kind of administered a lot of stuff because by this time Eli is a lot older. Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are also priests. And if you go back and look at those first couple of chapters, you find out they're scoundrels. <laughs> they they take, they overcharge, uh, they do all sorts of things to line their pockets. And Eli turns a blind eye to their shenanigans. And um, but he's still he's still a good man, a good prophet. He's just a, a lousy dad, I guess you would say. Um, but what Hannah decides is that God has given her this child. So at the appropriate time, Hannah takes Samuel to Shiloh and to the temple there and dedicates him to God and then dedicates him to the care of the old priest Eli. Eli is to raise him in the way of God so that God can use Samuel in a special way. Well, Samuel, we discover, is chosen by God to begin what would become known as the prophetic tradition. In other words, prophets. Prophets are unique. They don't hold an office. Uh, they don't hold a title but they demand to be heard and they speak, their purpose is to speak the word and the will of Yahweh God. And so one of the things uh, that happens is that um, Samuel has to tell the bad news when he's older to Eli that, you know, God is displeased with Eli and his family. And so they're going to be cut off from their role as spiritual leaders and guides. And sure enough, that is what happens to them. I'm sure that wasn't easy for Samuel to tell old Eli, but Eli seemed to have taken it well. Uh, one of the things that comes out uh, in the first, you know, like from chapters four through seven, um, is you begin to see the uh, conflicts that continue to take place have been going on through the book of Judges that we read through and even back to Joshua, where you've got uh, established nations, established peoples who are, well, they, they are pushing back on these Hebrews and Israelites coming in to their world and to their land and taking their land. And one of the greatest thorns in the side of the Israelites in this era is a group called the Philistines. We'll see them show up many times in the story in Samuel in particular. They are the most potent competitor uh, for control of the land around them. Uh, and they're a major military and economic threat uh, to Israel. The... Um, uh, Samuel becomes established in this time as Israel's leader, and what begins to unfold under Samuel's leadership, and we'll later see through the kings even, is the same uh, tradition of what we saw take place with the judges. There would be um, sin. The people would be committing some sort of sin. Uh, usually a lot of times it would be they reject God and they go off to find other gods or, or, or follow other wisdom and other gods. And then there would be punishment upon them. They'd lose battles. They would, uh, things would go bad for them and because they'd betrayed God. And then the people would repent, and they would repent and come back to God, and God would deliver them along the way. That's kind of what happens with Samuel. Uh, just like it had with the judges. This is the, the pattern, if you will. Now, that sounds very similar to a personal pattern, if you think about it. When we find ourselves succumbing to sin, whatever that sin may be, and sometimes that sin might be something we don't recognize as sin. And then here comes disaster, here comes punishment, here comes 
the chance for God to get our attention. And whereupon God gets our attention and we recognize where we have failed, we repent. And then God delivers us. Uh, does he deliver from everything or the consequent? No, but he delivers us from the sinful nature that we have had because we are not giving ourselves unto God. So Samuel is leading through all of this, working in all of this, and he kind of serves as prophet judge for a long time. But we're told in the book of Samuel that the people keep crying out the same phrase. We want a king. We want to be like other nations. We want a king upon whom we can rally around. We want one figure that, you know, is like the rest of the world has. Samuel doesn't like it. Um, Samuel disapproves of that request from the beginning. But God, Yahweh, intervenes. And he tells them in the ninth chapter that, you know, because he, he recognizes they need some central focus rather than 12 loose tribes who have some of the many leaders within their tribes. They need one unifying person to keep them out of danger of other nations and other people. And so God acquiesces to their request. And Samuel proceeds to warn, and I mean he warns about the dangers of kingship. He does it in great length. He spends the 8th chapter, he spends the 12th chapter, talking for a long time about the, the pitfalls of having a king. Uh, but it is the transition for the history of Israel. The judges have now faded to the past, and God is going to now raise prophets to speak to the people, and a king to rule over the people. And you know, say, well, can't they be both? Not if you pay attention to Samuel and Kings. Not if you take a good hard look at the Old Testament and the story of Israel. You kind of discover God has a special purpose for each of those positions. The prophet is to speak the will and work of word of God. And that is the prophet's job, uh, to be unencumbered by political trappings and by, um, uh, you know, accumulating things. The king is meant to civically, politically, militarily lead the people as a united group. Uh, and so... Why, though, don't we just have a king that does both? Because the king will always end up pursuing self-interest. And we're going to find that out. Um, that the kings fall for their own self-interest and ignore God along the way. Um, in Frederick Beekner's book of Peculiar Treasures, in which he talks about different people from the Bible, in his usual... Um, honest uh, assessment he mentions this about samuel and he said of samuel that samuel said there was only one king worth the time of day and his name was yahweh he also told them that kings were a bad lot from the word go didn't spare them a single sort of detail said the kings were always drafting you into their armies strong arming you into taking care of their farms they took your daughters and put them to work in their kitchens and perfume factories. They filled their barns with your livestock and got you to slave for them till you dropped in your tracks. What was more, he said, if Israel chose a king, Yahweh would wash his hands of them with good riddance. Samuel had it on the highest authority, but the Israelites insisted, and since Samuel didn't have the pep that he had in his younger days, he finally gave in. And the king he dug up for them was a tall drink of water named Saul. He was too handsome for his own good, had a rich father, and when it came to religion, he tended to go off the deep end. 
Samuel had him in for a meal, and after explaining the job to him, he anointed Samuel with holy oil against his better judgment, made him the first king that Israel ever had. And he regretted this action till the day he died. And even in his grave, the memory of it never seemed to give him a moment's peace along the way. The, um, the struggle is real. And so Yahweh prompts Samuel to be guided to find a king. And they, he picks the obvious one. The, from the description in, in the scriptures of Saul, he was uh, a personality that was large, both physically and in, in, in himself. Uh, and he seemed a natural uh, for that position. And the result is that, um, uh, you know, Samuel uh, gives Saul the kingship and, and Saul then begins to unite the armies. But almost from the get go, Saul has a problem. He doesn't quite do everything God demands of him to do. The first time this happens uh, occurs in the 10th and 13th chapter. Um, Saul's uh, first rejection kind of occurs in context with the Philistines. Um, Samuel just doesn't show up to bless the army one day. And so Saul, in a situation of distress and danger, and does not want to go into battle without a, a blessed sacrifice to God, he sets up the animal on the altar and sacrifices himself, which is overstepping his role of king. And you wonder sometimes if Samuel did that on purpose for Saul to fail. I don't know. But I do know this, and that is by Samuel's absence, Saul couldn't patiently wait on anything. And so he did it himself, and this distressed Samuel, and it distressed, obviously, God along the way. And he gets harshly condemned by Samuel. Um, Saul's second main rejection from Samuel that really gets Samuel's goat, if you will, is that Saul has a military victory over a group of people called the uh, Amalekites. Uh, well, the Amalekites uh, have a king by the name of Agag. I know, with a, with a name like that, just how nice and good could you be along the way? I'm not sure. Uh, but the result is that Samuel, speaking for God, had told Saul that he wanted to nothing to survive. He wanted Agag killed if captured. He wanted um, even the animals to be destroyed of the Amalekites. But what Saul does is Saul lets Agag live and figures on ransoming Agag back to the Amalekites for money. Then he also took the best livestock of the Amalekites he could find in the territory he just won and kept them for himself. The best of the livestock, in fact. Well, that's all it took. Uh, by the way, again, back to Beekner, trying to give you a picture of who Agag is. According to the prophet Samuel, God wanted King Saul to wipe out every last of the Amalekites not just the men and the women, the children, the babies, the old folks home, all of them. And when he heard that Saul had decided to spare the Amalekite king Agag, he became so enraged when Samuel showed up that he tore the royal robe off of Saul's back and told him to consider it just a mild foretaste of how God's going to tear the kingdom of Israel from his hands next. And then Samuel had him drag out poor King Agag, who was quick to figure out what was about to happen, and with something less than total conviction said, surely the bitterness of death is past, he told Samuel. But within seconds, Samuel had personally hacked Agag to pieces to prove that God meant what Samuel said that he said. Since Agag had hacked quite a few people, before we begin to feel sorry for it, as a king, Agag had hacked quite a few people himself, and he may well have been dismayed by the experience of being on the other side of that axe, but he really couldn't have been surprised because that 
is how the kings worked with each other. So what was perhaps new to Agag was the length of which the friends of God will go to make God's enemy, make God enemies of them. Um, yeah, a a Agag is an interesting story because it seems from that moment on, Samuel gives up on Saul and seemingly God gives up on Saul. Um, in fact, Samuel says to him that he will give, there will be a new king and the new king will be a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Well, it seems from the beginning, Samuel and Saul have a power struggle with each other. Um, I guess what I mean by that is that, you, you know, they just, they, they have this, uh, they just don't get along. Maybe it's because Samuel didn't want a king in the first place. You know, sometimes that happens. <laughs> You go to work for somebody and the, the boss didn't want you in the first place or or anything else for that matter. And you, you begin to recognize and you begin to understand that this marriage of, of uh, relationship isn't going to work out, you know, along the way. Um, so what happens? Um, I'm trying to find my spot again. Isn't that awful to say? Um, what happens uh, is that um, uh, there becomes this enmity that works its way out. Some have speculated Saul's mind wasn't right, or it became not right over time. Now, along this time of being forsaken by God, Saul finds himself in war again with the Philistines, and the Philistines have got them stalemated. They sit there and they make fun of Yahweh God. They make fun of the army of Saul and the army of Saul's not moving because they have this great, when I say great big, I mean great big champion whose name is, I knew you'd know it, Goliath. And what happens is all of a sudden, just prior to the Goliath episode, Samuel shows up at the house of a guy by the name of Jesse. Now, I'm hoping you remember who Jesse's grandmother was. That's right, Ruth. And Ruth had uh, Ruth and Boaz had Onan, Onan had Jesse, and Jesse had eight children, the youngest of which was, sent, was uh, David. Uh, and this guy is young, but he is very charismatic. And basically, Samuel sees in him what God wants and anoints David as king. Now, as this war is taking place and nobody's really moving anywhere or attacking anyone, David goes up to see his brothers who are on the front lines. And as Goliath shows up and begins to, you know, uh, bark out these bellicose uh, uh, insults to God and to Israel, David says, somebody ought to do something about that. Well, you can imagine he gets laughed at by everybody. But he says, no, I'm going to go take care of it. And you know the story. I don't have to go to too much of that. Uh, basically, David meets Goliath in the valley between the two to have a personal battle. And Goliath underestimates David and, more importantly, underestimates God. And so God uses David and his skill with a sling uh, which was an ancient instrument, not this, but this kind of sling made of leather and and you hurled it, you you let it go. Now, for anybody thinks, well, I've been hit with a pebble like that. And I, these were pretty good sized rocks that you threw out of a sling and they could do some damage from a distance. See, a sling is created for fighting from a distance. Uh, you know, a sword is created for fighting up close. The spear will get you a little bit farther away because you can either throw it or use it in, in combat with the shield. But the sling is designed to not let somebody who's perhaps bigger and stronger and um, more armed than you to get close enough to do damage. 
And David knew that. And God had shown David that. So he threw it and he hits Goliath right in the head. Knocks him down. And depending on how you look at it, he, he, he dies from that wound. Or he dies a little later when David takes Goliath's great big sword and chops his head off. Either way, it was going to be a certain death. For Goliath to say the least and immediately David becomes the toast of the town he becomes the guy who who everybody is is hailing and Saul sees this so Saul invites David to become a part of the court he learns that David writes his own music plays his harp and that his troubled soul could certainly use the popularity of a David for his own benefit well, as David begins to grow, he's, a couple things happen. He strikes up a friendship with Saul's favorite son, if you will, Jonathan. And Jonathan and David are inseparable. Bromance, if you will. <laughs> they, they, they are all the time uh working in cohesion and together doing whatever it is that needs to be done and saul sees this with envy he's envious of the popularity that david has that saul never seemed to quite achieve he is jealous that saw that david's even come into his family and so as things come on saul becomes paranoid he becomes angry he really gets ticked off one day because David, along with Jonathan and others, had taken a, a small detachment of the army and had gone out and had defeated the Philistines. And when they came back, all the women met them at the gates and they began to sing a song in chapter 18 that they would sing to the top of their voice that said, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. That did not sit well with the king. It probably wouldn't sit well with most anybody who has any kind of ego whatsoever, I'm sure. And so basically, for from eight, chapter 18 to 31 in 1 Samuel, a lot of things began to work. In the 16th chapter, as Saul begins to become broodier, uh, it's described even to the point that he has an evil spirit working on him. And out of that evil spirit, he begins to chase David. He's going to kill him if he gets his hands on him. And having been hidden for a time, David, by the priests of this, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, uh, you know, abbey, a convent if you were a woman, but, you know, at this abbey, the priests of Nob will not tell Saul where David has gone to. And so he kills all those priests. Yeah, he's going off the deep end. And then you have more jealousy that happened just prior to this when you have uh, the fact that Saul gave David his daughter, Michal, to be his wife, to kind of pull them together. But, but Saul's green eyes, his envy, was so great all he could do was fume over the whole thing. Um, and so what happens is David removes himself, has a small militia that goes with him, and he kind of operates out of the south of in the kingdom, the Judah area, not far from Philistia where the Philistines are. In fact, he kind of makes an arrangement with the Philistines. He'll be a mercenary, but he will not harm Israel. And in fact, he's given a the town of uh, Ziklag uh, to kind of be uh, the chieftain of that area for the Philistines. Um, well, as Saul continues to dive into his insanity, into his feeling of hopelessness and lostness, because he cannot seem to recapture relationship with God. Um, in the midst of all of that, uh, Saul goes to war with the Philistines. He is so paranoid though. He is so feeling foreboding 
that he has Saul, he needs something to ease his mind and pain, to give him some inkling of what is to come. Up to now, you know, the priests and Samuel and all of them had been for him. Well, Samuel has since died. And new priests have arisen, and they have not really supported Saul either. So Saul does the most amazing thing. He, before battle, consults uh, a woman who is simply known as the Witch of Endor. Now, there was a law in the land against witchcraft that drove anyone who practiced witchcraft out of Israel's lands. Beekner writes, as soon as King Saul passed a law against witchcraft and drove all practitioners out of the land, the witch of Endor traded in her broomstick on a bicycle, changed her pointed black hack for a summer straw, flushed a great many evil smelling concoctions down the john and tried to go straight. Then Saul fell on evil times. He felt so sure David was after his throne that he grew paranoid on the subject. Convinced his own son Jonathan had sided with David against him too, and the Philistines gathering for a massive attack at Mount Gilboa, Saul had to know how things were going to turn out, and since he and God were no longer on speaking terms as far as he was concerned, the prophet Samuel was dead he was forced to find some other place for information. We're told that Saul tried a dream book, but none of the dreams were in it. He tried to th things like tea leaves and Ouija boards, but they all malfunctioned. So he asked his servants whether there happened to be anybody that was still around who might be able to help if, he, if they knew what he meant. So he kind of winks at them. And they told him about this old party in Endor who looked like something straight out of Charles Adams. Sal disguised himself heavily for the visit, but as soon as he stepped through the door and said he wanted her to conjure up somebody who could foretell the future, she began to grow shrill and suspicious. What did he want her to do? Is it going to get the fuzz after her? And only when he swore by Yahweh that he wouldn't breathe a word to a soul, that she would go as far as to ask him who exactly it was he'd like her to get a hold of for him. And as soon as Saul said, Samuel, she knew there would be only one person in Israel who would dare face that fierce old ghost, and the cat was out of the bag. You are Saul, she said. And by that time, he was past denying it. And the next thing she knew, he let out a yelp that not only was enough to awaken the dead, but did. An old man is coming up, she said, and is wrapped in a robe. Saul realized immediately he was the right old man. Bowed so low, his beard touched the carpet. Except on the grounds of wanting to make himself even more miserable than he already was. It's kind of hard to explain why it was his old enemy, Samuel, he'd asked for. I mean, even before Samuel opened his mouth, Saul knew what he was going to say. And sure enough, the ghost of Samuel said it. Samuel told him that everybody was against him, including Yahweh. And not only would the Philistines win at Gilboa, but by the time that time the next day, Saul and all of his sons would be joining him in the grave with that saw crumpled in a heap to the floor. The witch did all she could to get him back on his feet. She tried to make him eat something, but he refused. She told him that she'd done what he'd asked her, and the least he could do in return was take enough to get his strength back and just go. But he didn't even seem to hear what she was saying. Finally, with the help of the servants, she managed to get him to where he was sitting on the edge of the bed. And when she produced a little meat and some freshly baked bread, he stuffed a bit of it into his mouth, and then Saul left without saying a word. Nobody knows what the witch did after they were gone. She probably just sat there in a daze for a while trying to pull herself together with the comforting smell of the bread she just baked. Maybe, maybe she decided to get out of indoor for good in case, you know, Saul broke his word and squealed on her, but she needn't have worried about that because... 
Saul had no more time left to squeal on anybody. On the next day, sure enough, Saul was just as dead as Samuel had risen from the grave to tell him he'd be. And this side of paradise or anywhere else, she'd never have to worry about seeing him again. Unless she got herself talked into having another seance, of course. But the odds against her doing that were pretty overwhelming by this point. Saul is killed, mortally wounded, however you wish to put it, um, at Mount Gilboa. And uh, the, a great defeat of Israel. There are two kinds of stories within the, the, the text that, you know, aren't really clear. One is that he was extremely wounded and he asked one of his soldiers to put an end to his misery and run him through. And yet there's another part of the story that says when he realized all was lost, he decided to fall on his own sword. To kind of end the pain he'd been in for so long. Any way you looked at it, it was the end of Saul, but it was also, unfortunately, the end of Jonathan. Jonathan likewise died at Mount Gilboa with Saul, as all of his other sons died there. And the lineage, well, there was still another son, we'll talk about that in a minute, but the main lineage of Saul was gone. Um, it's very likely that David never intended to to take Saul's king he king you know crown he he knew that at some point God would do whatever it is God wanted him to do and one of the things about Saul is the tragedy of who he is and uh, some say a tragic hero a tragic figure I don't know I just know that um, his life story is is sometimes our life stories one more time we delve into a look at that life story saul the first king of israel had three things going against him probably from the beginning one was the prophet samuel another was a young man named david the third and perhaps worse was himself Samuel never thought Israel should have the king in the first place, told them every chance he got. After Saul defeated the Amalekites, Samuel said, changed the rules of the game and took a whole pack of everything. And we mentioned that a moment ago. And Saul decided to sacrifice all of them. Samuel said it was the last straw and that was it and snuck off, anointed a boy named David. Sooner the better, Samuel thought. Saul was hit so hard by the news that Yahweh was through with him. His whole faith would turn sour. The God he'd always loved became the God who seemed to have an end for him, no matter what he did or what he failed to do. And he went into such a state of depression that he could hardly function. The only person who could bring him out of it was this very same David. He was a good-looking young redhead with a nice voice and would come and play songs on his lyre till the king's case of the horrors was under at least temporary control. Saul lost his heart to him eventually, and when the boy knocked out the top Philistine heavyweight, their relationship was permanently cinched, but it wasn't. David could charm the birds out of the trees, and soon all Israel was half in love with him. The ladies would dither every time he rounded the bend in his fancy uniform and Saul began to smolder. It was the one day when David was trying to chase Saul's blues away with some new songs that he burst into flames. He heaved his spear at him, just missed by a quarter of an inch. And his own son and heir, Jonathan, fell under David's spell. That's all it took. It was love-hate from then on. Saul hated David because he needed him. And he needed David because he loved him. And when he wasn't out to kill David, every chance he got, he was hating himself for his own evil disposition. One day Saul went into the cave to relieve himself. 
not knowing that David was hiding out in that very cave. And while Saul was taking 40 winks afterwards, David snipped off a piece of Saul's royal cloak. And when David produced the snippet later to prove he could have tried to kill Saul, but didn't, Saul cried out, Is that your voice, my son, David? And wept as if his heart would break. Because it was exactly what, in the end, his heart did do. Told in advance he would lose the Battle of Gilboa and die. And despite knowing that, maybe because he knew it, he went ahead and fought the battle anyway. And at the end, Buechner says, it's hard to hold it against him for tendering back to God that he had once loved a life that for years he had found now unbearable. Saul is a difficult story. And it, it's, it, it, it plays on the mystery of how, how God interacts with us. God is very upset with the fallen nature and sins of Saul. And God will be very upset with the fallen nature and sins of David, too, that we'll find out later. But he seems to extend a lot more grace in David's direction. Or maybe it's because David really did repent when he would repent. And Saul was just too psychologically wounded to know to do it. I don't know. We're going to start talking about David next week. And uh, I'm looking forward to that, as I hope you're looking forward to that, because uh, uh, if there's anybody in all of the Old Testament that is held up above and beyond everybody else, it is David. He casts the largest of shadows along the way. Now, as we get set for our prayer time together, let me go ahead and share with you, I've, I've talked with a uh, our nurses that are part of our church, and we've looked at the the uh, recommendations from the CDC and the COVID situation, and we've come to a conclusion that this is what we wish to do starting Sunday. We are going to have a, a paper, uh, a poster, if you will, put at each of the entrances. So you can examine it for yourself, or you can look here. I posted it on this Facebook page uh, this past week that gives you a very nice chart about regulations for people who've been vaccinated and people who have, who have not been vaccinated and when and where to wear masks. And you'll notice that for those who've been vaccinated, masks aren't that important. Uh, distancing still, I think, is important at this point. For those who have not been vaccinated, and, and everybody has their reasons. I'm not here to judge one way or the other. You should or shouldn't be vaccinated. There are health reasons not to be, I'm certain. There are uh, age considerations, I'm certain. Uh, it's your own personal choice. We live in freedom, and we want you to exercise that. But what we want you to do is to likewise, um, with freedom comes responsibility. And the CDC seems very clear that in worshiping and worshiping in an enclosed environment, if you've not been vaccinated, it is to your best interest and the best interest of the non-vaccinated who may be near you to wear a mask, at least when singing. Now, maybe you're vaccinated and you think, well, I don't have to wear a mask. I understand. But if you wish to wear a mask as well, particularly when singing, in order to set example, that is fine. Um, we are in this together. We are not going to sew scarlet letters on people with a scarlet V. You know, apologies to Nathaniel Hawthorne and, and the scarlet letter book. Uh, but, um, you know, um, what we do ask is that you're honest in your own medical situation and that you're responsible. We leave that responsibility to you and trust God to lead you to make the responsible, caring decision. 
So that is where we are. Also a reminder, June 13th, nine o'clock and 11 o'clock return to us. So I hope that you will be prepared for that. Uh, very briefly trying to go through some things. Uh, remember Matt Fouts who continues treatments, talked with him this weekend. Matt's been strong enough to get out. They actually got to take a little trip away from Houston to go to the San Jacinto uh, battlefield, which was the, the great victory of Houston over the Mexican army in 1836. And uh, they just look great in the pictures. Um, but continue to remember Matt and pray that the radiation does its job and that they will be able to return home to do the chemotherapy here. Um, remember Bill McDaniel, who may be facing future surgery. He has tremendous neck and shoulder issues right now. He was showing me Sunday, you know, to, to, to raise his arm only so far. It's difficult. It's very difficult. Uh, remember those in recovery. I think of Smitty from his surgery. You know, uh, Susan Hampton looked great when I saw her at the drive-thru uh, shower on Saturday. She was walking without any help of anything. And, just looking like Susan, acting like Susan. So we're grateful for that. And uh, Jeffrey Riggin, I saw him Sunday and he is progressing with his shoulder and rehab. Dave Maddox, finishing the rehab from the last hip, will be having the new hip surgery June 4th. So please remember him. Um, also, speaking of surgeries, uh, Jan Turner is having surgery next week. So please be in prayer for her and her family. Janice Turner remains at home with trying to get her wound on her back to heal. So remember her. Charlene Atkins, her father is in Sova. He's developed pneumonia and has not been doing well. So remember their family, if you would, along the way. And um, uh, just ask your prayers for others that maybe we didn't mention here. Paulette Martin, who's still facing surgeries in the future uh, for her legs. If you ever have any concerns you want to share, put them here. Write a comment down here, and we will get it and see it and make sure that we share that with everyone. So let us bow together. Heavenly Father, this is a day of your creation. So let us be good stewards of it by feeling blessed, by lifting up others in prayer, by checking on one another, by being responsible in these days of contagion. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would just be with these that we've mentioned and that you would be with us, that somehow we may be uh, the uh, protagonists of your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, we lift up our prayer. Amen. Looking forward to worshiping with you this weekend and hoping that you have a blessed week.